Well, the only way is ethics. That's what you said, yeah? Um, and you were preaching that to companies. Let's just think a little bit about ethics in companies for a second, John. Okay. To me, Alex Salmon screwed up for a friend and lost the vote. Uh, because when uh, Grangemouth, when, when Jim Ratcliffe, do you, know, do you know the background of Grangemouth? Excuse Because of your English. Well, if you look up the fourth, there's a huge pile of chimneys that smoke, and that's a huge refinery. Okay? So all the oil from the North Sea comes into the refinery. Yeah? That's a key industry. In an independent Scotland, that's a key industry. It's an absolute, fundamentally important thing. Yeah? Where the oil gets refined, where the crude oil gets turned into actual commodities you can sell. Now, it's a big, dirty place, Grange Mouth, and it's entirely owned by, and it was only bought recently, by Jim Ratcliffe, 2005 he bought it. His company is the majority of the shareholders are Chinese. Yeah, that's where the majority of the profit goes. He wants to extend Grange Mouth so that they can frack, okay? So that it can be an ecological disaster zone, but he knows that in order to do that, he's got to have governments in his pockets. So, there's a beautiful piece of high Tory poker that's played over Grange Mouth that, that happened last autumn. And it was really an extraordinary thing. They framed uh, 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 a unison employee. Uh, suddenly, they said, you future your computer on union business, which is okay. And for that, they summarily sacked him. They, they sacked the guy. Now, the union is a democratic union. Yeah? They obviously want to stand up for their union representative. So they say, okay, we'll have a vote on whether or not we take action. That vote takes time, weeks, two weeks, to organize a ballot. Within that time, Ratcliffe has threatened to close the entire plant. What? What? Why? Why, why did he do that? Why doesn't he wait for the vote? He did that in order to accelerate the accommodation he wanted for the Scottish and the Westminster government. Yeah? And the accommodation he wanted was that the workforce had no rights. No right to strike. No right to higher pensions. A whole load of things. He stripped a workforce of their rights. It, it was absolute naked class warfare. Yeah? Get rid of it. And you know, it's not even particularly important over their range mouth that they, they don't get pay rises because the pay is less than 2% of the turnover of the plant. Yeah? It's not like education where the pay is really important. Yeah? But it was naked class warfare to strip a workforce of their rights and to um, uh, get two governments eating out of his hand for these contracts he wants to develop the plant. He says it's unprofitable. Is it, is it not unprofitable? You know. Now, no, you can't come in quite yet. <laughs> My left-wing friends, okay, if you go to the SPC, it's other left-wingers. They're the ones who don't want their unions to be split up, but who are very frustrated with with anti-union legislation, right-wing legislation that comes from Westminster, basically. Yeah? Yeah? That was an opportunity to bluff Ratcliffe out, to show that he's on the side of a workforce. Yeah? To say, okay, sell it if it's unprofitable, we're going to buy it. We're going to have that as a national resource. Goes absolutely against every single neoliberal cell in his body to do that. Won't do that. He was out for another buyer. Yeah? So, there's a great triumph. The jobs are saved. But the jobs are saved at what cost? Anyway, everybody says that's where he lost because that was an opportunity to show that he stood on the side of working people and organised labour and structures of organised labour and sold out. I think it's only yeah, 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 so so bullshit. But then, if you're going to keep up. Uh, just a second, just a second, John. Okay. Well, let me just say that. I think you've made my case for a written constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a more compelling argument for a written constitution and for local control. What Angus said was that the UK legislation permitted this gentleman to do what he did, which he finds reprehensible. Yeah. My answer to that is, in that case, Angus, help write a constitution that precludes people from doing these things. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now, to say, let's continue with the present constitution because even though it's despicable, it allows people 
free reign, uh, it doesn't in any way upset my left-wing friends. I mean, what logic is that? It's far better, it seems to me, to say, let the people decide if that sort of behaviour is acceptable. If they deem it to be unacceptable, then you, you place on the Constitution a constraint on organisational behaviour of that kind. It's not, it's not rocket science, for crying out loud. And why would you want to stay wedded to a system which you deplore? I don't understand it. Well, I don't want to bat the Constitution, okay? So there's nothing, well, in, there's there's nothing in Elliot Bolden's book, well, just to say, about, and there was nothing in Alexander's address to the SUC last autumn, the last address before the referendum, about the key issue in that case, which is why don't we have majority workforce representation on the boards of companies? I think, I think we're getting... why, why should the Constitution defend this nasty institution of, of British capitalism? at the expense of working people, at the expense of the majority. We don't want a constitution that's just going to institutionalise the control of power as it is. So we must be able to distinguish. A constitution per se is not a panacea. A lot of constitutions are bad constitutions. And constitutions generally are there simply to reinforce the power of the status quo, of the ruling class. Yeah? Uh, sorry, so the problem of the constitution for everybody I, remains a problem. I, I, said, I did say all of that earlier. Yeah. I did say it's not a panacea. Yeah. I said exactly that. Yeah. What you said to me was, hey, here's a bad man who behaved badly and my left-wing associates are very upset. I'm saying, hey, there's a solution. And I haven't heard anything you've said since then that in any way counters that argument. You, you have, a, as I understand it, uh, based on the Scottish Government's uh, 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 bill, there will be a consultation on what is deemed to be, there will be a constitutional convention. So we all get a chance to be involved in writing a written constitution, which would bind the politicians. I mean, think about this. The reason that the UK is so badly, badly governed, frankly, is because a little elite run everything. That's not by accident, that's by design. When you don't have a written constitution and you deplore constitutional constraints, that's pretty much where you end up. Is a written constitution a panacea? Heck no. It depends on how good the people drawing up the constitution are and how much confidence they have in their own ability and their own experiences and their own capability to draft something which they feel reflects the values which they deem and hold dear. That's what, but that's an opportunity. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. You're never going to get this again, by the way. It's not going to happen again. No, no one in Westminster, by the way, is going to come to you and say, we would like you to help us out by writing a constitution. I mean, we've tried. Uh, I set up the Constitutional Commission, uh, along with others, to help educate people on constitutional issues. Uh, we, we actually sent, Elliot Bulmer went to the House of Commons and sat on a committee which was chaired by John Mann MP. And he went there to talk about forming a constitution for the United Kingdom. So Elliot sat there for half an hour listening to Vernon Montano and other so-called historical constitutional experts and said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not clear about what we're here for. It seems to me that most of this discussion is about whether a constitution would be a good thing to have and whether it ought to be written. But most of the conversation is about uh, how can we dish Alex Salmon. So he said to the chairman, why are we here? And the chairman said, so we, so we can dish Alex Salmon. He should have been there, I guess you know, a this, this, is, this, this is the level of debate that we're talking about. Now, it, it, to, say, to suggest, for example, I hope no one thinks this, that there is no appetite elsewhere in the UK for a written constitution would be quite wrong. There's an enormous appetite, but there's no mechanism. There's no door you can pass through to say, look, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about this thing. It's, it's, if there is a door, it's closed, it's firmly closed. And the people keeping it closed have every reason to keep it closed. Because all it would do would make their life so much more complicated. Because if they wanted to go to war, if they wanted to enact pernicious legislation, and it was unconstitutional, they would have to come back to you and seek permission. They don't want to do that. They would rather wing it. 
So I said to Angus again, if I was sitting in your shoes, I wouldn't worry about what various trade union officials said here, there and everywhere. I would be more concerned about how can I influence a written constitution for this locality here. And then hopefully if we can do one there, we can do one elsewhere. That would be my recommendation. Okay, well, probably it's a good idea to, to, to take this further by listening to you guys. Uh, but I do want to just say briefly what the, the, this is about. So it's like talking about opening up to everybody and writing a constitution and da 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 da. Okay. I had this idea that, like you, if a school could define its values, that would be good for the school. Most schools have antiquated charters. So I sat down for 15 minutes with a bunch of school kids. 15 minutes, not two years of consultation, 15 minutes. And I said, OK, what should school be? And this was a reply. From an education, we expect friends, fun, new stuff, and the right to a future. We expect to be able to show what we're best at and to become confident. We expect those that teach us to treat us with respect, with fairness, equalness, kindness, and we expect to be understood, to be given responsibility, and to be greeted by an open mind. And I expect you not to put yourself above me, to treat me as you would wish to be treated, to be non-judgmental, and then, when I need it, that you stand up for me just as I would stand up for you. And I went, oh, well that was quick. That's fantastic. That's a lot better because it was a Catholic school than a Catholic charter, you know, which had a lot of, lot of Catholic stuff in it. So we put it on the wall. Yeah? We put it on the wall. I found a method to put this on the wall. And then I said to Modern Studies, why doesn't the school vote on it? Do you want that as your new charter? Isn't that great? It's the kid's voice. And after all, they're the majority. And at that point, you begin to discover in a tiny microcosm what power is. How power is so inert. How power delays things. So it's still there. They kept it, but they never took the vote. Now that was a school in Edinburgh, in a well middle class part of Edinburgh. Well, I said my daughter. Uh, <coughs> State school, I'd say, but St. Thomas. And I thought, this experiment is no bloody good unless I've gone somewhere really tough. So I went out to Stranraer. I got in touch with a few teachers, and the guy out to Stranraer, which is, you know, way down in, in uh, the Priest Gallery, uh, he said, uh, this school, no one even gets a hire. But could you come and do, do it the same? So in Stranraer, again, sat down, kids were very serious, a bunch of 16-year-olds, with some of them with magnificent haircuts. And um, this was their poem, okay? This was how they defined it. School is banter, friends, grades and honor, and money at the end of the week. Two-way respect. The easy part of life, where they push you beyond what you think you can do, respect you, respect them, respect you better. We are family. No shall we carry it on. We can agree to disagree. Don't judge me by the look I choose. You can expect me in Mercury shoes to be there to stand up for you. Right? And they said, oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Wish we had that as a school charter. Two-way respect. I said, come on, we should make that a school motto. Uh, honor inter nos, it would be in, in Latin. Right? So, again, we put that to the senior management committee. Here's the kids saying what they want. This is good. Let's have these values on the wall. Yeah? Uh, the senior management committee absolutely didn't want it. They didn't want to be seen not to want it, but it's an parent council. The parent council said, we absolutely want that. We must have a vote. When they have a vote, they rig the vote so that while the majority of the votes go for it, there should be a poem on the wall. There was just one vote extra that said, now we want to leave it blank in a three way split. So it wasn't a fair vote. Yeah? And again, the powers that be did not move to allow this thing to be seen. Yeah? That basic principle, two-way respect, which is what these kids, that's what they wanted to say to those who have authority over them. Two-way, it's a simple thing to respect, to, to ask for. Stopped. Okay. So, you do see that we live in a quite a 
found the authoritarian society. Certainly through schools. You know, they are quite profoundly disempowering the majority of people that they affect. And you know, it's worrying. It should change. A change at the top, the constitution at the top could change that. It could change the whole ethos of society. I, I completely agree with that. Now, um, when, this is the last, last thing that I want to say. Uh, the card I gave you um, was the attempt to take a group of people to see whether or not it's possible to find basic empowering values that reflect what a community is and reflect how a government is bound to respect them. Yeah? So you can see it's in Scots here, it's also in Latin, Shetlandic, Gaelic, various. There's even a narrow translation of it now. But uh, if I was a writer of poetry, which is much better in Scots, Gennadius Maka. Yeah, it's so much better, isn't it? Okay, it was forbidden to set words. It's called one form of words to model the nation's behavior. Okay, that was a complicated one. To pick all the nation's white and wacky, okay, which is a mixture of Shetlandic and Scots. Pick all the nation's white and wacky. They would be that. Yeah? Ownership. Here, or in Shetlandic, Arnim. They say Arnim, like that. They don't teach Shetlandic in schools because they think it just leads to bad spelling. Right? Arnim is A A N I N. Arnim. Ownership. Here, taxonomy bound. Ownership obliges everyone to respect and to care for the sacred, the seen things. As I prefer to say, the important. To be considered in Owen County for, yeah, freedom of conscience. And we'll can and to recognize the gift of every individual, to respect it, care for it, nourish it, to care for and protect communities, and to care for the land. And wherever the land has been abused, to restore it so that it can support all forms of life. Just five principles there, five fingers on a hand. You put it in your pocket. Now, I put that up to see what would happen from Lowry to Stranraer, to Harris, to Dundee, to Dunbar, shoe shops, cinemas, bus stops. We put it in the Parliament. There's poems up in the STC in Woodland's Road in Glasgow. But the most interesting place to put it was there. Yeah? I don't know if you know this, but it's the most significant modern building in Scotland. It's, it's a tractor barn. Yeah? That belongs to Mike Forbes. Now he's the champ at the center of the community that's surrounded by Donald Trump's golf course. Yeah? Uh, he's the chap who's had eight years of abuse, of having a personal directed abuse. He's been called a disgrace to Scotland. His, his home is a pigsty. Uh, he, he, that's his wife, his mother, and his sister, who also lived there, I might say, from cover the book. Um, uh, had his livelihood cut off, water cut off, you've probably seen the films and so on and so on. With my heart and my mouth, I went up there and I said, look, can, can we fight back with values and words? Can I please put this on, onto your barn and can we turn it into a tent of democracy? What do you think about that? And I thought they might say, oh, just pass it off. And he said, what's taking you? Yeah? What, what's taking you? Hey, because I'd sent him a letter and I hadn't been in touch for two months. So he set to work. Okay? In the book, if you look at it on just here, that is the view from 8T. If you play the round, it costs only a mere 250 points to play 18 holes in Donald Trump's course. If you get to 8T, you look across the pigsty, the Scottish pigsty, and you see this little temple of democracy with its very style and its words. Yeah? And when I put it up, Mike said to me, he said, you know, when the film came out, in the middle of the night, I'm woken up, there's a transit van that's come right way down the line, coming to the farm. So I get outside and says, what's going on here? And guys come with pickaxes to destroy the groups. They were so angry. They wanted to do the anti-capitalist thing, right? Okay, they want to smash it up. 
And Mike said to them, you know, that there's a fight. I'll send them away. Point was, violence, that's him, that's Trump. That's that capitalist, pig-headed, arrogant attitude. That's violence. They've done violence to me, right? I don't do that. I fight with words. That's his words, I fight with words. And he accepted the words. Sacred freedom of conscience, the gift, the communities, the land, the gifts, you know. And that's who we are. Yeah? And then writing this book, I can put it also because many people have written this book with me into a historical context, the context of fighting for rights, into an economic context, the context of how, how the rights work in the globalized economy, and also allow people who have posted the poem to write about it. So that's just a quick comment. Okay, can, can we start from now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, so, so, so we've got 15 minutes left. Happy to allocate time. Lady there? So, we're, constitution wise, uh, we're, what do we do next? Where do we go next? Well, where we do next, uh, forgive me for shouting, because I'm not sure how long this is going to be sustained, but it's very pleasurable, but I'm not quite upset. Um, uh, the, um, the Scottish government has drawn up a, a, a Scottish constitution bill. Uh, and I, I gather it's to be uh, approved or otherwise by the Parliament after uh, the referendum is over. So it would be contingent, obviously, upon a yes vote. If there is a no vote, there will be no consultation. Uh, because there will be no possibility of having a written constitution. So it, it's based entirely upon uh, the success of the referendum. Assuming the referendum is uh, yes, uh, then the government is obliged to bring to Parliament arrangements for forming a constitutional convention. And the constitutional convention would use as its legal point uh, the draft constitution developed by the Scottish government, which is available on their website. However, uh, the consultation which would precede the formation of a convention. Uh, is it will take place and that one would expect that to influence the final act. Now, we have a constitutional conundrum, or at least one, if not one of many, which is that that act would then have to be signed off by somebody in Westminster. So somebody in Westminster would have to agree that there ought to be a written constitution for Scotland, while Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. Because if there is a yes vote in the referendum, not a heck of a lot changes in the short term. Uh, the uh, process uh, will not, in fact, uh, be anywhere near concluded until uh, uh, there is a vote for the first Scottish Parliament uh, in a sovereign Scotland in 2016. I would add one further thing, which is hugely important, is that the government has committed itself to the claim of right. Uh, is everyone familiar with the claim of right? Mm -hmm. The claim of right was developed by Canon Kenya Wright uh, during the discussions to, uh, on, the, on the first uh, cost devolutional measures, i.e. The, the, the Liberal Democrats uh, and the Labour Party, not the SNP, were involved in the Constitutional Convention Back, back in the 70s. It was chaired by Harry Kenyon Wright because he was deemed as a, a minister of religion to be above politics. And, uh, and therefore, people were prepared to take his guidance. He required, and suggested, and required that all the participants who sign a claim of right, that since been endorsed by everyone, every group in the Scottish Parliament, save for the Conservatives. And the claim of right is very clear. It says, that the people in Scotland are sovereign. Now that's hugely important because that cuts right across the principle that operates across the rest of the UK, which says that the Crown and the Parliament is sovereign. So we now have in the Scottish Parliament people who believe two completely contradictory things, i.e., the Lib Dems uh, and the Labour Party 
believe in sovereignty of the Scottish people, but they also believe in sovereignty of the Crown and Parliament. How they square that, frankly, is beyond me. Uh, but many poets have tried to address these things over the years. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, if there is to be a written constitution, it will be predicated upon the sovereignty of the people, which is a, a long desired uh, uh, principle across these islands, and it's never ever been close to being implemented until now. And it's yeah. hugely important. I can't it's only state it's, um, yeah. it's very close. Yeah, very close. But no one has actually gotten this close before. And it would mean that everyone in this room, everyone in this room, would be would own the state. And as 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 Angus has so eloquently argued, ownership is everything. Well, ownership comes with responsibility. That's the point. And if you own nothing, you don't have those responsibilities. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like if you own my taxes, you have responsibilities. You know. uh, but uh, it's a question, what next? I think that's a very good question. Yeah? Um, because, after all, the majority for no has never moved. Um, but I think the interesting thing about right now is not, is not uh, so much the prospect of independence as the concessions that have been won from, uh, if you like, the Scottish ruling class. Yeah? Uh, we asked, at a public meeting, we asked Nicola Sturgeon, what are our constitutional rights? Where are they? Where are they? Why are you dragging your feet? Why didn't you tell us? And she brushed us away. But within six weeks, they, they agreed to publish this interim constitution. Where, because where they, where they, it's got nothing to do with me. It's well, to do with the movement. Well, and don't well, interrupt me if you don't mind. You well, get your chance in a minute. Okay, crap. So, okay. so, so, so if I may finish, that was... So we're in the Quaker meeting house, place of worship. Can I please ask you to moderate your, your language and your behaviour to each other? The gentleman at the back there, and the lady there next is... Well, I certainly came to discuss about the constitutional potential of Scotland, not that sort of an anti palestine yeah, yeah. I think that's one way too far. Uh, and I think we definitely have a contribution to make, but I think that is getting in the way of your contribution from, from what I'm being passionate uh, So that would be my feedback to you, that this preoccupation with Alex Hammond is, is actually getting in the way. For most of us, that is not the issue being. We're really interested in the potential of a constitution for Scotland that we're all involved in co-creating. So that's what I feel in terms of what you can say. Lady here? Yeah, well, I think we should have two points here. One was you hinted at this earlier about that we could, if we stay as Scotland, we could change the UK from Scotland. It's carrying on from that concept. Why can't we have a constitution if we stay as part of the UK because we have our own parliament? Why can't we have a constitution? I understand there's devolved powers and non devolved powers, yes. but could you not have a constitution based on what we do? Yes. Yes. And can I answer that question? Because it's, it's technical and it's, uh, and it's a very good question, if I may say so. Uh, and the reason it's a very good question is it is possible we could ape the Austrian Hungarian Empire, uh, the one that saw its demise with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Uh, we could ape that, um, but we might not be well advised to do so. Uh, but there is a formula, it's called secure autonomy, it's, uh, it's described quite, uh, quite, quite well in this book, A Constitution for the Common Good, because we asked Eric to do so. Uh, for example, one could, it is conceivable, through an act of parliament uh, in Westminster, to set up uh, a, a state, to have a two-state solution. Um, the two-state solution would be a Scottish state and a UK state. For external purposes, that would not be obvious. The advantages to people who want a written constitution is they would remain part of the UK. The, adv the advantage to the UK is it would represent itself to the outside world, say, for example, the US Security Council in uh, NATO, etc., et as the UK. That would continue. But within the UK, there would be two states. The state in the Scottish, the Scotland state,
could develop a written constitution. Now, how would that work? The way it would work is that everything would be devolved to Scotland except for three areas. This is the way it worked in Austria-Hungary. Defence, foreign affairs and finance. Uh, the First Minister would sit on an executive council in Westminster uh, as deputy chair. And he would be bound by the written constitution of Scotland, i.e. that the people are sovereign. Even though the state, the overall state, would have a very different philosophy, i.e. that the Prime Minister effectively is sovereign. And they would have to negotiate that when it came to those three areas. Outside of those three areas, the Scottish First Minister could do what he liked, because he would be earning, he would be spending the money generated here. And he would, he would, he would pay a service charge to the UK government for free services, finance, foreign affairs, and defence. That would still permit a First Minister bound by the written constitution in Scotland, which precluded nuclear weapons, from saying to his UK counterpart, we, are, we need to discuss how we intend to remove these. But that removal would take place perhaps over a period of time. Now, are there flaws in that region? You betcha. Uh, does it always work? No, not very well. But people who are seeking some middle road uh, might find it attractive. It might or it might not. The, the, the UK state may deem that the, uh, it, it would be allowed to make its own arrangements for uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. And it may, it may decide, it may decide by the way, that there ought to be a, a, a Cornish devolution or the might of the Yorkshire Parliament or whatever. And some people might deem that to be interesting and helpful. I, I don't know. But that would be a decision which the UK Parliament would take on behalf of the people of England. Uh, uh, and uh, who knows? People might find that helpful. I don't know. Can I reply to that question just before you come in? It's like, uh, to turn it on its head,
by September the 18th, and that the possibility, as offered to them by their government, to have a great constitution. The suggestion, the idea that Westminster and all its constituent parts, including the things you support, are in any way likely to offer that opportunity is zilch. Okay, on that note, I'd like to thank our speakers very much. Uh, now, the, the Angus and, and John will be staying around for a few minutes to sign books and so on.